the prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. Habakkuk's complaint. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounding. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Our second reading is Psalm 13. And uh, David is in a very similar place to Habakkuk. How long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer me, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Let's pray. So, Father, here we are in this church on this morning. Your word never comes back to you empty, but accomplishes all that you send it to accomplish. So, Lord, we ask you to accomplish all that you want through your word. Amen. Amen. I'm assuming here everyone has a contract for uh, electricity and gas. Yeah. And mobile phone contract, internet contract. And I will say that within those contracts that you signed will be a complaints procedure. If you think that the service you have received is not up to scratch, if you believe your customer service experience was atrocious, you have a complaints procedure. You also know that if the complaint is not satisfying to you, there's somewhere else you can go. There's another appeal process. Ultimately, all the way through in certain circumstances to an ombudsman or to the court of law itself. And we know we have many, we have Ofcom that you can complain to if you see something on television or on radio of which you heartily disapprove. And recently Ofcom received 27,000 complaints, I think it was, about a dance routine on Britain's Got Talent. It was ultimately not upheld, but the complaint was there. So we know what it is to complain. We know that sometimes complaint is actually necessary. For how does any organisation learn unless it takes its complaints seriously? And what I've seen a lot in this job is complaints about the NHS. You know, something wasn't done and a letter's received about what's been, what steps will be taken, what will be learned. And those are good things. But we also know there's another form of complaint. And this is the one that we find in the scripture in Exodus. This is the people of Israel's complaint. It's small, it's incessant, it's whingy, and it really is not meant to do any good. So you know they're in Exodus, they're, in, they're as slaves for 400 years. They moan and complain that they want God to come and save them, much like David's psalm. How long, O oh Lord? God sends Moses. As Sarah said, oh, don't just say. Aaron says, but I can't speak. God gets mad, go and tell them. And as he brings them out, which is the one thing they've declared they've wanted for years, they're in the desert, what do they do? They start to complain. 
Oh, why have you brought us out here to die? Why not just leave us in Egypt? We were better then when we were slaves. Oh, Moses, you go up the mountain. Go on, it's all right for you. You're in the presence of God. What about us down here? We'll make a calf then. So there's that kind of complaint, which is this kind of, you know, low-level, constant complaint designed to destroy, to pull down, to take what God has given and say no. That's the complaint that gets God furious. This one isn't. This is Habakkuk, like David, desperately seeking to know, God, what is going on? It's not you don't do this, Lord, and you've not done that, Lord, therefore, Lord, I don't like you. This is a real sense of right. Tell me what's happening here. I am coming into your very presence, and I want to know what's going on. And as Sarah said, we have no idea who Habakkuk is. There are many theories. Even when he wrote, there are many theories. One which I lean to was that he was around when Josiah was around. And Josiah was called the good king. Josiah saw that he read, he read the law, the rediscovered book. And then he went around getting rid of the Asherah poles and all the high places. But the question arose in the complaints of the people, what happened to their hearts? Did they come into the presence of God saying, right, we've had these poles, we've done wrong. Oh, Lord, answer. Or did they go, well, I like that pole. Why is he taking it away from me? I like what we used to do up there. And then the question arises, well, so what? Well, in order to understand fully what's going on, we have to go to Deuteronomy 32, which is a worldview and a knowledge that Habakkuk would have been fully conversant with. And if we come to Deuter Numbers, sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 32, it's the Song of Moses, but it's also a great reminder of who this God is. And it tells, again, to remember the days of old, consider the generations long past, Ask your father and he will tell you, your elders and they will explain to you. Now listen to this. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. Some actually says according to the sons of God. So you have to take your pick. Did he do this for Israel or did he do it because there's some beings up there that God allowed certain influences over? Either way, it then says this, and this is the important bit. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is his allotted inheritance. So it's basically saying at the time, round about Babel probably, when God divided the nations, when he struck their languages, when he sent them out, he said, you, I'm sorry, are disinherited. You have no lot with me. Israel is my portion and my people. I will take them to be my own. And then it says he will enter covenant with them. He will marry them. He will literally cover them with his garment, which is an Old Testament image of marriage and sexual intercourse that joins the couple from two to one. He joins them. He covenants with them. They will be his people. They, therefore, it comes then with a corollary, which is if you are Yahweh's, you don't belong to the nations. You don't belong to the gods of the nations. You cannot join in with the gods of the nations. You are my people, says God. And it's a covenant that he binds himself to. And it comes with, like all covenants do, like all marriages do, it comes with agreements. You cannot marry someone and hear the words, forsaking all others, I'll keep you only unto me, and then go and have sexual intercourse with someone else. For that consummation binds that couple in God's sight into this union. The two become one. The flesh is literally, if I may use this phrase, glued together. So to then take that and do that act with someone who's not the person you're married to is to break the covenant. That's what God says to Israel. You're mine. This is what Habakkuk's picking up. And let's go back to Josiah. So what had happened then? Well, this covenant, excuse me, had been broken. We know full well in Samuel, they come to him and say, Lord, we want a king. That in itself was not a bad thing, but what do they say next? We want a king like what? Anyone? Like the other nations. We want to be like them. Their temples are bigger than ours. The way they worship is far better than the way we worship. This God of ours is austere. He's different. He's other. He's holy. We can't just enter his presence in any which way we like. We have to bring doves. We have to do this. He says, don't come into my presence unless this. This time's of, of, of cleansing. 
There's all of these things. How boring is this? Look at what they do. Look at what they get up to. Look at the joyous worship they have. And you see in later, and Paul, that what went on in some of the temples was that very sexual encounter that perhaps you wanted outside marriage you could have because it was the worship of the God to do so. Sacred temple prostitutes. So you could join in. It was fun. Also, we know, because scholars who are not Christians have said it, you would sacrifice children and you would make such a noise so that you couldn't hear the children scream. Why would you do that? Because the God of the nation demanded it. And that's how you kept in with him. That's how you kept this God sweet. And you did all kinds of wonderful things. And what did Yahweh say? That never entered my head. Not for one second did it enter my head that you would do these things. But the command was that they would be his alone. They were not to worship these gods. Yet Israel became jealous of what the other gods were, what the other people had, and they wanted to be like them. So the Asherah poles go up. So Solomon marries how many wives? And so we go on with Ahab and Jezebel. And so the influences of the world that God had said had been disinherited for now, they will be re-inherited through Christ. But that's for the future. He disinherited them. He takes Israel. And why? Because Israel was meant to be what? A shining light to the nations. They were supposed to see and ask. And it's known that circumcision on the eighth day works. It's the best time. It's also known a lot of cervical, these all cervical cancers are not great in circumcision and other things. So God was offering Israel a covenant that they were to shine to the disinherited nations who would come and say, what have you got? Why is it like this? What is it that you get blessed with? Why are you doing this? And they should say, because our God is the most high. And you hear it all the time throughout the whole Old Testament. The people around them said, we've got gods. And Israel said, yeah, but ours is the most high. He is God of gods. You may have a God, but ours is bigger than yours. He's the creator. There's the polemic. He's the creator of the world. You build your ziggurats. God's got to come down to look at it. It's that small. He is this large creator, sustainer, awesome God who enters into covenant with Israel. And yes, as an aside, that covenant still stands. We are drafted in. We'll look at it in a bit. But with Habakkuk, you see, this is what Habakkuk knows. And he knows full well where Israel has gone. He knows the rebellion. He knows the stubborn hearts. He knows the worship they've given to other gods. He's seen the reforms. But what does it do to the people's heart? The answer is nothing. So Habakkuk begins his complaint. Now, it's only the first chapter of three. As we journey through this together, we'll see God's answer. And often what we will find with Yahweh is he doesn't give you the answer you're looking for. He does not explain himself, ever. Not fully. Job says, if I get hold of him, he'll just overwhelm me with how awesome he is, which is exactly what Yahweh does. He overwhelms Job. So I'll say this at the outset. As we look at who Yahweh is, as we come to complain, he listens. Is he upset with this kind of complaint? No. Does he tell us it's illegitimate to say this? No. Does he like it actually when we go into his presence like this and like David? Yes. Is he going to give us the full answer? No. And we'll see this with Habakkuk. As Habakkuk journeys through his complaints, and there's two of them, he begins to see who God truly is. So let's begin though. How long, O oh Lord, must I cry for help? Like David, I need help. What on earth is going on? But you do not listen. I'll cry out violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? You see, there's the great prophet thing. Look. They were told to see. People in our nation, we pray like this. It's very individual, very enlightenment, very much about me. I read preparing the sermon quite shockingly that the ancients in Jesus' time would not have prayed with their eyes closed. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. They prayed by looking. They saw what the world was like. And if you look at all the prophets, Yahweh takes them and says, come and see. Come and see what I see. Come on. Come on, Isaiah. Who will go for me? Who can I send? I'll go, says Isaiah. Good. Eat this scroll. Now go and tell them, be ever looking and not seeing. Be ever searching and never understanding. Go to them, Isaiah. But see what I see first. Ezekiel, son of man, come with me. Do you see these things? Let me show you other things that are worse than this. 
Do you see the sacrifices in the temple to these gods? Does it shock you, son of man? Come with me and let me show you this even worse. See, Ezekiel, see and know. Jeremiah, the same. To the point where Jeremiah complains like this. He actually almost says, Lord, you lied to me. And Jeremiah gets his book burnt twice, we know, but he's thrown in a well. Because he brings the word of Yahweh to a people that don't want to hear it. Because the prophets around the rulers are saying, peace, peace, everything's fine. Don't worry, the covenant stands. So you see, Habakkuk knows all this. But the one thing that happens to Habakkuk happens to Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all of them. It's a burden. Once you see the world through Yahweh's eyes, as he sees it, the Holy One, it's a burden. It can be no other. And I don't mean a burden like a rucksack, like Alex said last week, where we carry around rocks. This is a burden of the soul, where we Christians or Israel should have seen and known and grieved. It's what Daniel does. He gets up and he says, oh Lord, on behalf of my people, I pray. You find in Malachi that they grumble. That word grumble, complain. They grumble against the Lord. They say, let's find it. Malachi. The problem is now, do I know my Bible? <laughs> um, it, it, have I got the right book here? Yes, it's here. Sorry, forgive me. It's Malachi when it says, uh, robbing God. And it says this. You have said harsh things against me, says the Lord. Chapter 3, verse 23. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said it is futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers prosper and even those who challenge God escape. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honoured his name. So it's those in the world that you will always get. This idea of what is the point of serving God. Everything is wrong, he doesn't listen, he doesn't care, I've had enough. And those who know that they come to him with a cry and that what's actually going on is they're being burdened by the rebellious nature of humanity. That we have decided the covenant that we've made we don't want to keep. We want what the world wants. And do you think that's a perennial problem for the church? Of course it is. How much of the world out there should influence what goes on in here? How much? We're in it, but not of it in that old phrase. But how much of what the world wants should be in the church? How much should we be influenced by their music, by their styles, by their fashions? Or are we like Israel that wants to say, oh, but this God's austere and it's very boring. What we do in church is very, very boring. We've got to liven it up a bit. Look at what they do on a Saturday night. Look at the church. What is it? How should it be influenced by the world? And how should we be influencing the world? Habakkuk knew all this. And he sees violence in Israel because they've abandoned Yahweh and gone after these gods. And we live in a world, believers, whether we like it or not, of which there are many, many philosophies out there, all crying for allegiance, all telling human beings what the best way is. Out there in our world is Buddhism, where you do it again and again and again until you get it right. We know we've got Islam, we've got yoga, we've got mindfulness, which is yoga in another name. We have Eastern mystical practices everywhere. We have religions and also we have the greatest philosophical movement of the modern world, humanism. That there is no God, that we are ever progressing. We are wonderful human beings at heart, we're good. And all we need is a bit more progress. Those Christians, those believers, they're idiots, they're boring, they're dull, they can't cope with life. They need a God to lean on because they can't deal with the way the world is. And also, as you've heard me say from here before, the one now, the philosophy that's ruling our world, and even, and this philosophy has woken the liberals up finally. The classical liberals are beginning to see what this is. And from a humanist, secular perspective, are fighting back, let alone what we as Christians should be saying. That's postmodernism. Intersectional postmodernism. The idea, like I said the other week, there's no truth. Truth is irrelevant. Truth is a construct of the culture in which it emerges. And then they use the word discourse. So the language around this is the one that perpetuates the power structures that keep other people oppressed. And you and I are part of that power structure, preaching from here because I'm a white man, so therefore I've got privilege. And I'm preaching from a gospel that says there is a truth. There is no truth, it's a power play. 
It's constructed. They'd want to deconstruct every word I use to look for some kind of thing, and then they'll say there is no truth. That's out there in that world. You want to look at the riots in America? You want to look at the fact that people in jobs are being cancelled and fired for saying certain things? That's the teaching. That's what's out there in our world. And these are the people that say free speech is violence. Habakkuk cries, I see violence. And they do. They say words are violence. So what you have now, and people of, of, of an older vintage, you'll remember a time where you could debate with someone and come to a disagreement. Now, we have a society and a Facebook and a culture that says, I am invested so much in this, and so is my identity, that if you disagree with me, you don't have a different opinion, you're actually hateful. And you hate me, and therefore I've got to get you out of my life, go away over there. And actually what I want then to happen is I want the law to stop you saying this, because I find it offensive and upsetting, I need a safe space. No, we can't have this right-wing person to come and share his views. Free speech is violence. That's what's going on. And we're hearing it. And my question arises is, does it come into the church? Is this teaching in the church? I'll leave it with you. My answer is yes. It is. It's encroaching in the church. And the more we as Christians go back to this concept of the humanistic idea that all human beings are really, really good, and all they need is a bit more of a push, then we're undoing the very essence of our gospel, which is that we're rebellious sinners, which is what's going on in Habakkuk. That's what Israel was. And so all the pressures have gone, but the hearts are no different. And so he says, I see violence. Why? Because they cast off God. There was no fear of God. They didn't think there was any judgment. And when we're like that, violence wins. What did we see on the streets of Paris yesterday? Not Paris. It was in France, sorry, though, wasn't it? There's your free speech argument right there, ladies and gentlemen. So it goes that if we cast aside God, you know, and the atheists want to argue with us that, you know, you can't say there's no morals without God. All right, okay. But still, if you cast him off, if humanity becomes the judge of its own morality and its own goodness and its own right, where are we going? Where are we going? I've read, I don't know how true this is, that if Donald Trump win this election, there will be riots. If Joe Biden wins it, there will be riots. There is violence in the streets of America. Peaceful demonstrations, burning cars down, looting shops. What have we seen in our own nation? Violence. Why? because we've turned our backs on the living God and we've made ourselves the judge and the grace of everything we know what's right we know what to do we know what it is and then it says this why do you make me look at injustice see this is the ultimate question what Habakkuk's asking here is why don't you step in why don't you do something like the superheroes in the film Superman sweeps in doesn't he and deals with the bad guy Spider-Man Batman it's all there why, O oh Lord, so powerful do you do nothing? And wait for Habakkuk's answer, God's answer next week. It will chill us. What God does. And Habakkuk's in the presence of God. And he says this, destruction and violence are for me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Do you truly believe that we live in a nation of conflict? Because I think we do. Our nation is in uproar. We've got those who want to lock down and lock down hard. And we've got those that are questioning the lockdown. Asking, does it do the very thing it's supposed to do? And I listened to something very interesting that said, those who are calling for the lockdown the most are quite high paid people and are unlikely to lose their jobs in the meantime. The others, the working class, the people of Blackpool who work in the leisure industry, they're the ones that are going to lose their jobs. And there's that conflict, that strife in our nation, the strife of philosophy of how do we live? What philosophy do we base our life on? So then it comes back to us as Christians, like Peter said. Do you have a reason for what you believe? Can we give a reason to a world out there as to why we hold the faith that we do? Why we say there is a God? Why we say he will come back to judge the living and the dead? Why we declare at the end of time there'll be a judgment? Why we believe in the resurrection, not a conjuring trick with bones? Why we say that there was a man called Jesus, a Jew who walked the streets of Israel. He was crucified. He was put in a tomb, but he didn't stay there. Do we have confidence as such in our faith that we can say to the world out there, no, this is where we stand and we will not deliberately change what we are to suit, to attract you, 
Because I say to you honestly with all my heart, and please hear me, if we do that, we'll attract them for so long till the next attractive thing comes along. And then they'll move on to that. Church is not Saturday night ant and deck. Church is coming into the presence of this God that speaks to Habakkuk. And so when Habakkuk gets the burden, let me ask church, do we? Not the burden of the rocks, but the burden of, oh Lord, how long? This is wrong. This is not right. So that we come like the solemn assembly of Malachi and pray. Or do we say, oh God, it's not worth serving you. I've done all of this and all I see is this and it's all wrong. The church is not getting the numbers in that I want. The revival that I've cried for isn't happening. I give up. Or do we ask the Lord to say, let us see what you see. But please, believers, be careful. Because if you ask that, he will. And it will be a burden to your soul. It will burden you, like that song said, to get on our knees and pray. But, and here's the corollary to this, as we see with Habakkuk, and I, I don't want to jump ahead because I, I want to let this book speak as it goes along. But do you know what you find in that burden as you come into the presence of Yahweh? Do you know what else you find? Worship. Because you realize whose presence you're in in the first place. Who has the future in his hands? He says to Isaiah, I know the beginning from the end. Is there any other God like me? Let them declare it. And then you find this release, like Alex said, the rocks are released because you're in his presence. And from the burden comes the joy, comes a worship, comes the dancing of David by the ark. Because you know in whose presence you are and in whom you trust. And that's what it boils down to. Do we trust him? Do we have confidence in him not sound of music or oh, i have confidence in me i'm not saying we shouldn't but the humanistic confidence is the philosophy of our world the christian one is to say as sarah said no you are not just you are a child of god that song we sing i am a child of God, saved, redeemed, known by name. Every hair on every head is counted. We say on us in the morning, all desires are open, all secrets, sorry, no secrets are hidden, all desires known. Do you know he knows your name? He knows your name. The psalmist says, when I get up, he goes with me. When I sit down, he knows it from afar. Before it's on my head, he knows it. And the other psalm we've read here says, when we come into his presence, he delights. He delights in that. He delights when we come and say, oh Lord, I see what burdens are here. Come with me, Yahweh. Teach me. Show me that thing we read. Tell the other generations. Ask your father, walk in the ancient ways. So let me say again, please. If you were saved in Billy Graham, if you've heard vicars like me for 30 years, if you've been in church and sang for 50 years, the Lord bless you. You have a heart and a strength of Christ that you can share. Let not them look down on you. Let not the church that worships the youth look down on you. You have a wisdom of Christ to share. You have the knowledge of God that has sustained you all these years. And I said at nine o'clock, and I'm saying it again, Mara, I do apologize, please, for this upsets. Keith was the man I could turn to, a man I could ask advice of, and the Lord took him, and I said, right, thanks, Lord. Not Myra, you know, it's your husband. I'm like, right, brilliant. Who do I turn to now? And yet, I will always remember that finger. Always. And on a Tuesday, the first Tuesday I walked into this church after the Monday service, I still remember that booming laugh of Richard Bibby. No, he's not still with us, but we pray for him because he's not well. This is us, the burden of the joy of the Lord. That's what it's called. It's the joy of the Lord is my strength. That burden is not the rock burden. It's not something God says, here, have it, and you can't carry it. For Paul says he has not yet tempted us beyond what we can bear. But that solemn assembly of Malachi is what I believe we're getting to in the church. There is going to come a time where the Lord will take this scroll and we will have to decide where we stand. Do we stand with the church that wants the world, that wants to ape the world and be like the world, or do we stand in the presence of the Holy One of Malachi and let him put our names in that scroll? But it will burden us in prayer if we do. And there will be times when we'll cry out violence. We'll see a nation that's turned its back on God. We will see a nation where the wicked hem in the righteous, where they mock and distort and say our gospel is a hate crime. 
where the righteous and justice is perverted, where the idea is we will stand and go, what the, where did that even come from? How can anybody begin to say there is no such thing as truth? I would love a, a postmodern doctor to do my heart surgery. Would you drive across a bridge built by a postmodernist where there is no truth? You won't last very long because the thing would collapse. Because what we're saying to this world is there is a truth. There is a way. There is a hope. And we're going to give you a name for the truth and the hope. Are you ready? It's called Jesus Christ. He is the truth and the life and the hope. He will forgive all who truly repent. A broken reed he will not break. This God is long-suffering. He desires the death of no one. And as you've heard me say a thousand times, when he appears, what the people do? The first thing they do when they see the Holy One of Israel is what? Come on, please, you've heard me say it. What do they do? They fall down on their face. And what does he say? Do not be afraid. It is I. Get up. Oh, Habakkuk, I've got a job for you, mate. You need to go to this people. And let Isaiah, they'll be never seeing or hearing. Like Jeremiah, they'll slap you. Because what they want to hear is peace, peace, when there is no peace. They will tell you that your preaching is divisive and boring and dull. They will tell you to take it away. We want to hear the nice things. Oh, Jesus says it. You know that psalmist when it says you, you played the lute and you did not dance? It's to do with funerals and feeding in the ancient world. The, the, the desire for joy above all things. The idea of no, it's not happening, no, it's not happening, no, it's not happening. But it is happening. And that culture war out there, we can't deny in the church that it's happening. It is. The question for the church is where's our voice? Are we confident, like Peter said, to give a reason and an answer? Are we there to say to this world, no, I'm sorry, that's a hollow philosophy. I follow the Lord. And I will pray with a burden for this nation. I will cry for the children of this nation. Your parents and grandparents, people at home are too. What's the future for them? Social media. Social media. I read something that said young boys of youngest 14 are starting to think the acts of sex is what they see on a search engine in Google. Girls are not commodities. My two daughters are not commodities. They are children of the Lord. Ladies, the Lord has saved you. He's given you a witness and a testimony. Don't let anyone look down on it. Men, like in Timothy, he has made you a man of God. Be a man of God. Stand in the gap. Be a watchman. It will be a burden to you. But let me prophesy, it will also be your joy. Oh, for the day where holy people dance like David around this church, singing the joy of the Lord is my strength. Singing, I am a child of God, knowing in whom we stand, that he's not going to explain the whole of history to us because then we're God and he's not. But that we can, oh, I've got to be careful here, my precious children, my beautiful Gemma, that I can say, Lord, you're her father. Here you go. I have to let you be God. I have to say, Katie and Naomi are yours. You love them more than me. Even to my dear wife, who I love more than life itself. I have to say, Lord, she's yours. And I think I know the way, but you may know a different way. And I may want things that I think are right, but the Lord may say to her, no. You are mine. I have bought you. I have called you by name. And there will be times when we will say, how long, oh Lord? I will stop soon. But this has burdened me all week. It's burdened me greatly that how we pray, how we are as a church, how we are in his presence, and how if we cry in his presence, let it be. Please, in this time, be patient with one another. It will come out, the burden, it will. It does in the solemn assembly that we cry righteous tears. Jesus was moved to tears when he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you, but you were not willing the stubborn hearts, the determination that the covenant's too restrictive, that we want what the world wants, for there's more pleasure in the world. And they're cool. We don't want to be seen to be boring, do we? And if there's one word I would ban from the lexicon of the church, it's the word boring. 
because the church is not and should not be. The church should be one of joyous dancing before the Lord and of times of lamentation. Times when we see what the Lord sees and we pray with our eyes open. And like Habakkuk, we journey and say, come on, we're going into his presence. Not like the men of Malachi. But with this joy that says, oh, okay, Lord, why? Come on, Lord, now, now, now. That's how revival comes. When we long for it. When we cry for it. Not the laughing revival. Not the gold teeth revival. That's a strange fire. The true revival of the true God, holy and exalted, lifted up and other. Which one is it, people at home and here? Which one do we want? Please don't answer that. Let, let, answer it in your own heart. Do we want a church that's like the world? Do we want a church that challenges the world to think again? Do we want to be part of that solemn assembly that comes and is burdened by what we see? Prepare to pay that price when the world mocks. But also knowing together in that presence, I'm repeating myself, aren't I? That there is the joy of the Lord is our strength. Oh, believers. And let's journey through this book together. Be Bereans. Search the scriptures. Don't just take what I say. I have the privilege of being a watchman. Of burdening of, sorry, forgive me, of the Lord burdening me with his word, which is also, believe me, it's a joy and a privilege. And all I can do is lay before you the fruits of my labor and say, now people in the covenant with the living God, take this. Be Berean, search the scriptures daily, see if what I say to you is true. Because I've said it a thousand times, and I'm sorry if this sounds in any way, I don't answer to you in the end. I'll answer to him for how I handle this word. And what do I want, the praise of men or the praise of God? Do I want a church of 400 because that's good for me in numbers or do I want a church that seeks and loves the Lord and I'm not saying here anyone doesn't. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? The temptation of a vicar that just wants nice numbers. How long, O oh Lord, must I call for help but you do not listen? Like David said, but then David gets to the praise. And we will get there. Wait till you get to the end of this book and you see what Habakkuk praises. When he realizes whom he's dealing with. How awesome he is. How truly, truly patient he is. Slow to anger. Abounding in great goodness. And one day, one day, in the twinkling of an eye will be changed. And he who is the truth will look you in the eye. Philip, he's going to look you in the eye. Myra, he's going to look you in the eye. And you know what he's going to say? Well done. Can you imagine that? The Holy One of Israel saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter your rest. It's overwhelming. It does, it moves you to tears that we see this world. And yet the Holy One of Israel is our strength. Just read some of the stories of the persecuted Christians and the joy they get from him. I almost wanted to do a sermon on Paul in lockdown. Paul was in lockdown for two years. Sorry, I'll stop. The Lord loves you. You are not just like Sarah said. You are not just this or just that. That's the world. And thank you, Sarah, because it's a lie. You are a child of God. And you can stand and raise holy hands. You can dance in this church. You can sing at home. But one day, he's going to take us home. He's your God and my God. He loves you and he knows you. But he wants you to write the name in that scroll. Let's pray. Holy Holy is the Lord. Sorry, Susan, I'm not taking anything from you. Holy is the Lord. Listen, I know time's going away, but we're in lockdown. What are you going to do? Have a barbecue of eight? Let's take this time to be in his presence. Let him do his work. We sang it when he moves. Hell is frightened. 
When God moves, it's frightening, but joyous. When God does something, do we want him to? Lord, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty who was and is and is to come. Lift up his names with sound of singing. Lift up his name in all the earth. Lift up his name and give him glory for he is worthy to be praised. Now, you are two meters apart, you've got a mask. If anyone wants to stand in this next minute and just give the Lord a statement, a sentence of praise, you've got a minute to do it. Don't have to, but if you want to, you've got a minute. Hmm. The truth. The remaining truth, the truth that can be saved. Oh, Amen. Lord, may we be receptive to your word. May the soil be receptive to the seed. And may we bring fruit to your honor and to your glory. Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Yeah. Oh, Lord, hear. Hear the voices of your people in covenant with you. Hear the voices of those you have saved. Receive our praise. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. Over to you, ma'am. Hey, we're going to sing. Well, well, you're not. I say, honestly, let me say again, when we can, we will have a Christian last night of the proms. What do you think? We'll come in here for an evening and we'll sing our favorite hymns. We'll dance to the Lord. And if you end up crying, we'll do that too. Yeah, let's have a song. What is it? Sorry, what's the song? Well, they are. I didn't know, genuinely. The goodness of God.